if we're thinking about ourselves and we're thinking about our, our lives accurately, sometimes when we look at what we stand for or what we represent or what we proclaim, maybe we realize we're misrepresenting what we should. You see, on the very first page of your Bible, you see that God doesn't create stone statues or or gold images to represent him. No, it's you and I that were created to bear his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. And if we're honest, we don't bear that image very well at times. Sometimes, you know, hey, when we're really on our game and have had our coffee and, you know, all that kind of stuff, we do okay. Other times we fail miserably. We're created to represent God. We're created to live His will and proclaim His goodness. We're going to fast forward through a lot because if I'm honest, I was convicted this week and I, I spent a lot of time wrestling. I, I normally write sermons way out in advance and I finalized this one this morning and I'm actually kind of still writing it while I'm talking to you. And if I really go with the text I've picked, I might get you out of here by bedtime. But I'm going to try to move quickly. There's a lot in your Bible about representing God. And more so about misrepresenting God. We've been talking about bearing God's name, bearing his image, representing him. And that comes from Exodus, where God frees a family, a nation. For that purpose, God frees Israel from Egypt. He saves them. He brings them out of Egypt, through the waters, into the wilderness, to a mountain. And God shows up on that mountain and asks this ragtag bunch of former slaves to be his people. To be a nation of priests. That will represent him to the rest of the world. He says, will you do that? And they say, we will. So he gives them the terms of what this looks like. We tend to refer to them as the Ten Commandments. And we've looked at those over the last few weeks. And a key moment in those ten words that God speaks is a word that calls us to not misuse His name. Exodus chapter 20 verse 7. You shall not misuse the name. And it goes so far as to tell you that if you do misuse the name, you won't be held guiltless. This is a serious moment for Israel. Because they are going to be the people who represent God to the rest of the world. Now, if you've heard the Exodus story, or if you've watched the old Charlton Heston movie, you know that before Moses even comes down from the mountain, what are they doing? They're not representing God. And this is not just an Old Testament thing. I, I often, when I preach from the Old Testament, I hear people go, well, yeah, but, you know, just give me Jesus, right? Right? Again, I love that song because it reminds us that we are totally helpless without Jesus. But there are so many in our world that think I'll just sprinkle a little Jesus in with whatever I want to do and it'll be all good. I'll just slap his name on things that I want and it'll it'll work. As a preacher, I deliver a lot of sermons and teach a lot of Bible classes. And I'll be honest, that's draining sometimes. Uh, to, to never interact with the Bible in a way other than to prepare to say something to somebody, that, that's draining. And so just as I, I pour out, I also need to receive. And so throughout the weeks, I listen to things, I read things, I, I, I try to read books that will recharge me, I try to listen to sermons that will recharge me, and, and listen to music occasionally that will do the same thing. And this week I ran into problems with all three of them. This isn't just an Old Testament thing, folks. This is a Christians in America thing today. Because one of the sermons I came across this week slapped Jesus' name on a lot of things that God says don't do. 
I listened to a sermon, church in Colorado that shall remain nameless to protect the guilty, where a preacher got up in the pulpit and shoved the name of Jesus saying that Jesus supports abortion and homosexuality and all kinds of other sin and said, if you don't agree with me, read your Bible and you'll see he does too. Now, I don't know what Bible that preacher is reading, but in that moment, he is not representing Christ well. I listened to a song this week, and when I listened to the song, it seemed to use the name of Jesus just like the word abracadabra. It's just magic, right? We'll just throw it here, and we'll throw it there, and we'll attach it to this and that, and it'll just make everything great. Is that really how the Bible uses the name of Jesus? Is that what Jesus promotes when we follow him? I'll just throw my name to whatever you want to. I encountered it in an article I read again this week. It seems like a lot of the times the church wants to baptize the world, not to save the world, but to be like the world. And say, I I can do that too. But what we find in the pages of scripture is a God who is holy. Who calls his people to be holy. Holy, to not be just like the world, but to represent Him and His agenda and to point a world that's lost and groping in the darkness for something and for our lives to be that light to show them the way. And so over and over again in the pages of your Bible, we find examples of people who don't represent God well. And we find problems in Scripture of people trying to represent God, and they don't. What we often fail to realize is that it's a major theme in your Bible. And we've got a lot of texts to cover, and I'm more or less going to shut up and just let the prophets say what the prophets say. And I want us to see this theme. Because over and over again, it's going to come up. That Israel is designated to represent the name of God to the world, and they are punished for failing to do so. So, we're going to start in Jeremiah. It's a text that you've probably heard Jesus reference if you've read the Gospels. When Jesus goes into the temple, and he finds that the worship of God has turned into anything but the worship of God, church looks more like Black Friday at Walmart than it does a worship service. He is incensed at the injustice that is happening right there in the temple. And Jesus overturns the tables and he quotes two scriptures, one from Isaiah, one from Jeremiah. This is the text that he's referencing in Jeremiah. It's Jeremiah 7, we're going to start in verse 4. Do not trust in the deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Basically, in Jeremiah's time, they were using this phrase, they were using God's name, and they were attaching it to whatever they did, and they just claimed it was good. God's got his temple here, he's got his name here, it doesn't matter what we do, because he's with us, right? Oh, they're throwing his name around like a magic word, and God says, don't do that. Verse 5, if you really change your ways, and your actions, and deal with each other justly, And verse 6 is exactly what Dakota was referencing earlier. If you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, and don't shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I'll let you live in this land, in the land that I gave your ancestors forever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder And commit adultery and perjury and burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you've not known. And then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name. And say, we're safe, we're safe to do all these things. Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? I've been watching, declares the Lord. And from there, he goes on to talk about where people used to worship him, and it's left desolate. It's a threat that God, through Jeremiah, is giving the people of Israel. If you don't represent my name well, I'm taking my name out of here. And I'm going to level this place and haul you off into captivity. By the way, if you've encountered your Bible, did they change? No, they didn't. 
and the temple was leveled, and the city was leveled, and the people hauled off into captivity. Ezekiel talks to the same group of people. Jeremiah is trying to keep them from going down that path. The people choose to go down that path. And Elijah is speaking to them and telling them why God has punished them. This is, I said Elijah, Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 36. And we're going to start in verse 16. Again, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, when the people of Israel were living in their own land, they defiled it by their conduct and their actions. Their conduct was like a woman's monthly uncleanliness in my sight. Yeah, yeah, Ezekiel gets a little graphic, doesn't he? So I poured out my wrath on them because they had shed blood in the land and because they had defiled it with their idols. I dispersed them among the nations and they were scattered throughout the countries. I judged them according to their conduct and their actions. Can we pause right here for a second and see, does God care about what we actually do? Yes, it's not just about claiming his name. It's about what we do to represent that name. And Israel has done it poorly. Look at verse 20. And wherever they went among the nations, they profaned my holy name. For it was said of them, these are the Lord's people, and yet they had to leave this land. Their sin that caused them to be hauled off in the captivity reflects poorly upon God. So much so that you're going to see a new theme here. Verse 21, I had concern for my holy name, which the people of Israel profaned among the nations where they had gone. Therefore, say to the Israelites, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It's not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name that you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. Does it seem like God cares a little bit about the reputation associated with his name? That he wants his people to live according to what represents him. It's very important. So watch what God says he's going to do. Verse 24, for I will take you out of the nations... I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back to your own land. And I will sprinkle clean water on you. And you will be clean and I will cleanse you from all of your impurities and from all of your idols. I will give you a new heart and put in you a new spirit. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you. And move you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all of your uncleanliness. I will call for the grain and make it plentiful and I will not bring famine upon you. I will increase the fruit of your trees and the crops of the field so that you will no longer suffer disgrace among the nations because of famine. Then you will remember your evil ways and your wicked deeds and you will loathe yourselves for the sin and detestable practices. I want you to know I'm not doing this for your sake, declares the sovereign Lord. Be ashamed and disgraced for your conduct, people of Israel. Ezekiel doesn't sound happy, does he? God doesn't sound happy, does he? It is because the people have misrepresented his name. And they have associated all kinds of sin and detestable practices with his name. And so God's solution is, you're not going to operate by your heart anymore because it's corrupt. And you're not going to follow your spirit anymore because it's corrupt. God says, I myself will put my spirit and a new heart in you. And when you live by my spirit, And the new heart that I put in you, then you will begin to represent me before the nations. Then I will bring blessing on you. You don't just slap my name on stuff. You do what I'm asking you to do and you do it by my power. Isaiah picks up on this as well. He knows the same need. And he sees a time when God's going to do this. And he tells us a little bit about this time. This is Isaiah 44. But now listen, Jacob, my servant Israel, whom I've chosen... This is what the Lord says, he who made you 
He who formed you in the womb and who will help you. Do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. And they will spring up like grass in the meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. Some will say, I belong to the Lord. Others will call themselves by the name of Jacob. Still others will write on their hand, the Lord's, and will take the name of Israel. You see, Isaiah is seeing a time when God will pour out his spirit, and it's not just on a family line. It's on those who choose to live by God. They make a choice to follow God, and they bear the name. They choose to bear the name. There's a phrase in here that you will write on their hand, the Lord's. I'm not going to Hebrew out on you. I did enough of that in Bible class. But it's the same phrase that the high priest wears right on his head when he represents God to the people. It's almost as though the people are going to choose to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, to borrow the words of God and the words of the Apostle Peter. There will be a time when people will choose to represent God. My question is, if you've chosen to wear the name of Christ, are you representing Him? Do your actions, do your thoughts, do they bring praise and glory to the name of Jesus? Let's be honest, how much praise have you thrown to sports teams or restaurants or all kinds of things this week versus Jesus? Because when we choose to wear his name, we become his representative. Isaiah sees the need for this. And at the end of chapter 63 and the beginning of 64, he prays this prayer of repentance. It's a fancy Bible word that means to change direction, to stop doing the stupid and start doing the righteous. To not live like the world, but to live as God has called us to live. And he sees the need in the people of Israel. And he prays this prayer of repentance on behalf of the whole people, begging God for another outpouring, pleading with God that he would do something to get people's attention, just like he did at Sinai. This is chapter 63 of Isaiah, verse 19. We have become like those over whom you've never ruled, just like those who were not called by your name. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. Can anybody remember a story in the Old Testament where the mountain trembles and God is there? Sinai, right? Ten Commandments, right? Where God says, don't misuse my name. Isaiah is pleading for another Sinai moment. Verse 2, as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil... Come down to make your name known to your enemies, that the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to help those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. No one even calls on your name or even strives to lay hold of you. For you've hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. Yet you, Lord, are our Father and we are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Isaiah is saying, God, we need another Sinai moment. 
We need to see you on the mountain. We need to hear from you what you want us to do. We're nothing but clay. Shape us into who you're calling us to be, God. Help us. And what's amazing is God does just that. You see, when you turn from the Old Testament and all the prophets pleading and begging with God to show up, show up on the mountain and tell us who you are, we come to the Gospel of Matthew. And the guy whose name is Jesus, Yahweh saves, Yahweh's salvation, shows up. And he goes up on a mountainside and sits down and gives the law. Maybe you've heard of it, the Sermon on the Mount. You see what Isaiah pleaded for, Jesus does. How can we be saved? Jesus tells us. And he doesn't water down the law. If anything, he raises the bar on it. He doesn't say, just slap my name on it and do whatever you want to. No. He says, you know the law, you've heard it. Say, don't murder. I'm telling you, don't even get angry with people. You think the bar's here? Ha! Huh, get up here. Don't live in the gutter like the rest of the world does and think you're, oh good, because I didn't kill anybody this morning. But have you killed anybody in your heart and in your mind? Jesus raises the bar on us. Because to Jesus, what we do matters. While he's up there on that mountain giving that sermon, he gives one of the most terrifying paragraphs he ever says to me. It's in Matthew chapter 7. It's near the end of the sermon. Now, this is how you wrap up a sermon, let me tell you. Because he says in verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. You, you, you mean, Jesus, your name's not a magic potion that we just throw out there? Uh uh. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Oh, so what we do matters. Mm -hmm. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name? In your name, did we not perform miracles? Well, let me modernize that a little bit. Didn't we slap your name on everything we did? Isn't that good? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I don't have the slide up there, but the very next line is, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is a wise man. What we do matters. Now, I have fallen short of that. You have fallen short of that. We have all fallen short of that. And God understands our weakness. God understands that we often choose our own path and not his. And so Jesus has paid the penalty for your and my sin. When we don't represent him well, he represented God perfectly. And he bore our imperfection and put it to death on the cross. And God has given us the mission to follow Jesus, to represent Jesus. Let me tell you a good rule of thumb. When God gets up on a mountain and says something, listen to him. When Jesus gets up on a mountain and does something and something happens, pay attention to it. Another mountain scene in Matthew's gospel. This is Matthew chapter 17. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. Mm. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. And just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Do you remember the story of Moses going up on a mountain and talking with somebody? Who does he talk with? God, do you remember the story of Elijah running for his life and going up on the same mountain, Mount Sinai, and he talks with somebody? Do you remember who he talks with? God, who are these guys talking with? Exactly right. They're talking to God. That's the connection that Matthew is trying to get you to make by telling you this story. That when you see 
Jesus, as the writer of Hebrews tells us, he is the exact representation of the God they've been talking to all along. When they've been called to represent God, they've been called to live like Jesus. But it actually took Jesus to come and do it, didn't it? And so they're up there and they're talking to God in the form of Jesus. And Peter is so wigged out by this, he doesn't know what to do. I mean, he's stunned, and he's like, uh, we'll just start like a construction crew <laughs> and build something. We, I don't know what to do. And just like Isaiah prayed for, the cloud shows up on the mountain, and the voice comes from the cloud, just like Sinai. Here it is again, verse 5. While he was still speaking, a bright light covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son. Whom I love, and with him I'm well pleased. Listen to him. You want to know what God wants? You listen to Jesus. The last mountain scene in Matthew's gospel. The very last chapter. The last words of Jesus in Matthew's gospel. Jesus goes up on a mountain. His disciples meet him there. And even while they are there watching the resurrected Jesus, some of them doubt. It's amazing, isn't it? Oh, just give me Jesus, I'll be good. They had him. (laughs) Raised from the dead, and they still doubted. The beauty is that him going to the cross and taking our sins covers our doubts. It covers our missteps. It covers our failures. But we don't wallow in our failures. And we don't glory in our sin. Instead, the blood of Jesus covers our mistakes. And he picks us up and he moves us by his spirit to walk forward. And because Jesus went to the cross and because God raised him from the dead, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and do whatever you want to. No. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. That's how we live matters. And when we do that, he says, surely I will be with you to the very end of the age. We don't have to walk in this world alone. When we wear the name of Jesus, we will fail. Don't make an art form of failure. You're going to mess up. You probably already messed up this morning. I know I have. Each day, we start anew and we commit ourselves to wearing the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. If you haven't done that, It matters. It matters more than anything else you will do today. It matters more than anything else you will do in this life. If you have not confessed him as Lord and Savior, if you have not made him Lord of your life, if you have not died to your old self and been raised to a new life. By the way, if you weren't here at the beginning of Bible class, Zachary Lane was baptized. It was a beautiful example. It was a beautiful example of somebody going, I'm messed up. Give me Jesus. If you haven't done that, don't leave here without it. And if you have done that, I want us to listen to the spirit within us that God says it's going to remind you of your sin. And it's going to help you to walk the way that I call you to walk. So this morning I want you to listen to the pleading of Jesus to get right with him and listen to this pleading of the spirit within to represent our God well. And if you need any help in either of those areas, come find me while we stand and while we sing about the name that is above every name. Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God.
Jesus is indeed master and crown. Master because he rose from the dead and now has all authority in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And Father, our friend, because he cared for us to carry our sins far from us, as far as the east is from the west. So Father, may we rejoice in the fact that you love us, that you have called us, and that you have saved us so that we might bear your name. And in our failures to do that, that you cover us with your grace and your mercy. Guide us by your spirit this day and every day. And help us always in our words, in our actions, and in our thoughts. Honor you as Lord and Savior above all. In the name of Jesus that is above every name we pray. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. And may he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. God bless you. We'll see you next time.